introduction about our speaker today. Uh, Mr. Senge Sering is a researcher and human rights advocate. He was born in Pakistan, occupied Gilgit, Baltistan. He writes about the sufferings of the people of Gilgit, Baltistan and raised these issues regularly at international forum. He has worked extensively on revival of linguistic identity of the region and its cultural linkages with Tibet and India. Mr. Sering completed his engineering degree from the University of Engineering and Technology, Pakistan, and Masters in Development Studies from the University of East Anglia, England. Some of his previous engagements include working with Hira Industries, Aga Khan Foundation, and Baltistan Cultural Foundation. In 2009, he was selected as a, uh, selected as a visiting fellow to the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, New Delhi. His paper titled Expansion of the Karakoram Corridor, Implications and Prospects, offers an in-depth analysis about the ongoing Chinese projects in Gilgit, Baltistan. Currently, Mr. Sering runs the Washington DC-based Institute for Gilgit, Baltistan Studies, which has a firm commitment to the protection and promotion of human rights in Gilgit, Baltistan, and holds conferences to disseminate information on local autonomy and democracy, extremism and terrorism, demilitarization and cross-border trade, environmental sustainability and preservation of indigenous culture. Since its inception in 2010, the Institute has established partnerships in the United Nations, the US Congress, the British and the European Parliaments, as well as think tanks and academic institutions. We are very happy to welcome Dr. S uh, Mr. Sering here for this so Academy talk. Namaskar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here um, as part of the bigger Indian family. I think uh, it's a great opportunity for someone from BOK, or uh, now we call it Pakistan Occupied Ladakh, uh, Pakistan Occupied Libya, Pakistan, to be able to like express myself and exchange views with all of you. I uh, will try to speak a little louder. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, so today, um, it's a very important day, and I don't, uh, I don't think you plan it that way, you know. But November 16 is the day when. Uh, Pakistan officially took control of Gilgit. So a British uh, military officer, Major Brown, he uh, was part of this whole scheme uh, of uh, uh, orchestrating uh, military incursions in Gilgit, Baltistan, and other parts of POK. Um, it's uh, famously known as the Takhil operation and Gulmarg operation. These are the two operations that uh, the Pakistanis, with the help of the British military, conducted in, uh, in uh, Jammu and Kashmir after uh, Maharaja Hari Singh, he acceded to India on October the 27th. Uh, so uh, then uh, because of these military incursions, uh, Pakistan was able to uh, take control of one third of Jammu and Kashmir. And Major Brown took, uh, played a major role in that. Um, and eventually Pakistan uh, gave him the award of um, it's called a Sitara uh, Imtiaz or Sitara Jurat. It's, it's one of the, the prestigious awards uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Pakistan uh, as his services to the Pakistani uh, uh, country, uh, nation and, and, and the country. Uh, so on 16th of November, then Pakistan sent its bureaucrats in Gilgit, Baltistan, and they officially claimed Gilgit, Baltistan. As, as their own, so I think uh, it's very you know appropriate to have an event on this day, so we could talk about uh, the occupation since then. Uh, it's been 70 years in, 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 in Pakistani occupation. So right now, after the creation of uh, Park, uh, the uni Union ter Territory of uh, Ladakh, Gilgit Baltistan, the entire Gilgit Baltistan has been made a part of Leh district. So now Ladakh is two districts, Kargil and Leh, and the entire Gilgit Baltistan has been incorporated into Leh district. Uh, rest of the POK, which is uh, Muzaffarabad, Meepur, Kotli, there, there are about 10 districts there. They are still part of P POJK, and Gilgit Baltistan is it's not part of GNK anymore, it's part of uh, Pakistan occupied Ladakh. So I, I like to like, you know, see it that way. Uh, we border Afghanistan and China on, on the western side, about 100 kilometers, 106 kilometers of Afghanistan and Gilgit Baltistan, we share a common border. And about, there's about 9 kilometers of a Wakhan Strip, and on the other side of that strip is Tajikistan, so we're not that far from Tajikistan either. If we climb our mountains, we can see Tajikistan's land from there. 
So it's very strategic. It was part of the Silk Road uh, from India. You know, uh, the trade happened through China, India, and went into Central Asia and, and Turkey and rest of Europe. And uh, Ladakh and Baltistan provided some of the Silk Road branches, and then Gilgit also provided some branches that came further south into, let's say, Shimla and Delhi and other places. Um, so before partition, uh, my hometown, Skardo, was the winter capital of Ladakh because it's really cold in Leh. Leh is about 12,000 feet from sea level, so it gets extremely cold. So they used to do the Darbar move uh, and come to Skardo, which is about like 7,000 uh, 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 feet from the ground. Uh, so we were part of Ladakh even before the partition. That's why we've been put back into Ladakh. Uh, Gilgit was its own entity, and it was controlled through uh, Kashmir province, and we were controlled through Jammu province. So Ladakh was with Jammu province, and Gilgit was with Kashmir province. So there were two provinces in Jammu and Kashmir at that time. Um, so uh, you already know the new map of India. Okay, everyone may have seen it, right? Everyone has seen that map. It's really famous now with the blue turquoise color. Yes. And, and the funny thing is because, you know, we have turquoises. Ladakh is famous for turquoise, so they're using, you know. Turquoise water. Exactly, very, very appropriate color for Ladakh. Oh, you want to? Okay. So if you look at the next map, you will see uh, the major towns of Gilgit Baltistan within the new Ladakh Union Territory. And this is where Afghanistan is, this is where China is, Xinjiang, and this is where Tibet is, right? This is all Afghanistan, and then this is the rest of Pakistan there. So Tajikistan, yeah, after nine kilometer of a, a small strip here, Tajikistan uh, starts right here. So Tajikistan is here, then Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. So the whole Central Asia is connected with Wakhan. So for India, you know, it'll be only uh, that small strip of Wakhan, and then it'll be in Central Asia. So ethnically, we are uh, a big mix because of its location and how different ethnic groups came together. And uh, there were the Parthians, there were the Scythians, uh, there were the Sogdians. These were different, you know, ethnic groups that eventually uh, formed a blend. And then there was a big attack from Mongolia and Tibet, uh, and that gave the eastern part of uh, Gilgit Baltistan its culture and language. So we speak, you know, Tibetan dialects. Our names are Tibetan. Um, and we were all Buddhist, and we were Hindu for about 550 years. And there are like, you know, uh, several uh, architectural and archaeological, you know, important sites there that still exist. Uh, Gilgit was a very famous um, uh, site of a Buddhist uh, university from where all the Buddhist scholars, uh, they were dispatched to Central Asia. So all the Buddhism that you see in Uzbekistan today and you know other places, they had their uh, kind of like a you know, staging post in Gilgit. Mm -hmm. So from Central India or Northern India, the Buddhists would go to Gilgit in the universities and then they would be you know, further dispatched further north from there. And in Baltistan, we had universities where our uh, scholars were sent to Tibet. So even though Tibet, Lhasa, if you look at the map of Tibet, you will see that it's very close to Bihar. Mm -hmm. But there was no direct uh, preaching from Bihar into Tibet. It went through Ladakh. It went like this, along the Indus River. So a lot of Balti famous you know, uh, <coughs> scholars who converted local Tibetans who at that time were following Bon religion. Right. And the bon, you know, they became Buddhist. It was because of famous Balti scholars. Um, so, uh, and, and the people in Gilgit, they are of Dardic ancestry. So Dardic is, is a bigger linguistic racial group that incorporate um, people from Chitral, people from Gilgit, the Kashmiris, uh, and uh, these three large groups. The, this, the Gilgit people speak a dialect of Dardic called Shina, and the Chitrali speak Khwar, and the Kashmiris, they call it Kashmiri. Uh, I don't know what they call it, you know, in the ancient times, but now they, their language is called Kashmiri. And all three of them together is called Dardic, right? And we speak Tibetan dialects in Baltistan. So Baltistan is almost 90% Tibetan. Uh, and then up north along the uh, Tajik border, it's Tajiki language. 
because of obvious reasons, it's proximity to Tajikistan. Um, so as I said, you know, we were Hindus first, then Buddhist, and then in, by the end of about 17th century, it was all converted to Islam. It was mostly Shia Islam uh, compared to the rest of Pakistan, which is Sunni Islam. And, you know, uh, what's happening today, that the persecution and oppression is basically because of that big difference that we have between Shia and Sunni and lack of trust and lack of, uh, uh, you know, co collaboration between two, two sects because of their ancient past. Um, Shias believed that there were Sunni rulers who massacred Prophet Muhammad's family in, in, the, in the, the, the desert of Karbala, right? And since then, they have not been able to really reconcile their differences. Um, but in Baltistan and in some parts of Gilgit, we still have a lot of reverence for our uh, ancient born um, traditions. So for instance, the local gods are called Hla. In Ladakh and in Baltistan, our gods are called Hla. And when people go for hunting or for uh, you know, uh, take their yaks to the pastures, or they start agricultural uh, activities like harvest or sowing or all of that, we offer uh, our offerings to the Hla. So despite the fact that, you know, th this is a very uh, 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 different kind of Islam that, you know, you'll probably not find in the rest of Pakistan or among the Muslims in, let's say, UP Bihar anymore, right? So these are some of the pictures that, you know, they, they still exist there. Uh, this is about 26, 28 feet tall boulder, and it has uh, 32 uh, Buddha etchings on it. The two of two of them are Maitreyas, the standing Buddha, which are the future Buddha, right? And the the, the one sitting in the middle, and then there are about 28 around it is Sakyamuni, which is uh, the, the Buddha from the past. In local language we call Chenrezig in, in Tibetan. Again, these are all Buddhist uh, sites. I wish if you had a you know. A, Something bigger, but so yeah. they date back to which year, which which, uh, which decade? Uh, Conversion to Buddhist? Yeah, they date back to which date? So which most of back? our uh, etchings are from uh, 280. 280. Yeah. All right. So now we'll talk about Pakistan and Gilgit Baltistan. So our relationship with Pakistan was built on a big lie, basically, and that big lie was that we would become Pakistani citizens, we would become Pakistani. That was this big lie that, you know, we, we were fed when in 1947 the war happened, right? Um, and local people thought that just like the rest of India, which was divided and, you know, Punjab went to Pakistan, half of it, and then Sindh and all these, Gilgit, Baltistan or Kashmir will also become part of Pakistan. But what they didn't know was that the princely states is a different way of accession to India or Pakistan, and the ruler of Gilgit Baltistan and Jammu Kashmir had acceded to India, it, and it was it was done through a constitutional system within the British framework, so it was irreversible. Right? This is what we believe that uh, it was a constitutional setup. So. Um, the representative of Queen or King George in, in India was Lord Mountbatten. In Pakistan, it was uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And whoever you know, acceded to India and Pakistan and accepted by the British you know, monarchy became part of those countries. So that crucial, that vital part of information was not disclosed to us, mm -hmm. that we had already uh, you know, become Indian citizens. And we thought that since physically we are in Pakistani control, we would become Pakistani. So if we had known it in the beginning, we, our relationship with Pakistan would have been very different. But you know, we, we thought, and because of lack of information, knowledge, education, at that time literacy was literally like you know, less than probably five or six percent. Um, so years after years, decades after decades of this expectation that eventually we'll become Pakistan, you know, and then 1980s came and and more information poured in, you know, nationalism kind of like, uh, you know, uh, regained foothold and eventually then people started realizing that uh, we cannot have constitutional relationship with Pakistan because of certain reasons. Uh, so today, literally everyone is aware that we are not Pakistani. So it took about 70 years for the people to eventually realize that, but it's, you know, uh, so what happens is that when you build a relationship on a lie, then eventually uh, the, the 
uh, the occupying force knows that eventually it will be and known to people, so then they have to come up with different tactics to continue to control and suppress people and benefit from the land because, because of our location. As you know, without us, Pakistan cannot have a land link with China, right? Uh, and, and because of all the resources we provide, you know, all the Indus River comes from Gilgit Baltistan. So 60% of the water for Pakistan comes from our land, from PO, POJK and PO, PO Pakistan to Ladakh. And then, you know, the Chinese route and all that. So I think it, it became very important for Pakistan that it, even if local people were to find out that they're not Pakistani, they were not going to let them go. So they use different tactics. And today I'm going to, going to uh, talk about those tactics which eventually, you know, uh, laid this foundation of distrust among local people and their turn against Pakistan. And you know, the, today you will see uh, huge demonstrations that we were against Pakistan because of yeah. that, that relationship. So first was that, you know, as I said, we were not going to be a constitutional part of Pakistan, right? So instead of giving us our own constitution, Pakistan ruled us without any constitution for all these years. So even today while I'm sitting here and talking to you, Gilgit Baltistan does not have a constitution. So Indian Ladakh, Indian Jammu Kashmir, they right from the first day, you know, when India became sovereign in I think 1955, right? Just 1950 or it was a it was a British Dominion, and then it was allowed to have its own constitution. So 50, 50, 50 yeah. So Pakistan had its own constitution 56. You had in 1950, right? Jammu Kashmir could benefit from that constitution because, yeah. because it was naturally through accession became part of India. We were not going to have that uh, privilege. So even you know in 1956 and then later there was another constitution and then the third one which was 73 constitution of Pakistan by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto which they call the unanimously accepted by all federating units, right? We, we still are not given any constitutional rights in Pakistan. So we cannot vote, you know, during Pakistani election, for instance. We cannot access uh, justice through Pakistani judicial system, Supreme Courts, High Courts. We have our own kind of like no man's land, right? That's how they've been ruling us. So this is, as a result of the occupation, you know, Pakistan have been ruling us without constitution and, uh, and this has brought a lot of uh, distrust among people and you know, there's a lot of anger and anxiety as to when this problem will be solved, will they ever become Pakistani? And now they know they will not become, but during the 60s and 70s and 80s, they thought, you know, we're just about to take a turn, right? Next corner and we'll be Pakistani. And like, you know, it, it never happened. What and is the population that we're about? So we're talking about just about a million and a half. It's a very small um, area, but the, the, the land mass, I was talking to uh, Banerjee, it's uh, about maybe four or five times bigger than Haryana. So it's huge. If you put Punjab, Haryana, Himachal all together, Gilgit Baltistan is still bigger than that. Uh, it, so Pakistan's province, KPK for instance, it's bigger than KPK. It's, it's huge. It's literally, you know, it's a, it's a very a huge land mass for in China, Afghanistan, and you know, and, and so uh, it's, it's important for its location, not, not for its population. And one time I think uh, Yasin Malik was uh, uh, sitting on, on the stage and uh, Sajad Loan was with him and he was trying to brag that, you know, the reason why Gilgit is not important uh, because Kashmir has five, seven million people. And I said, look, if you have more feeding mouth, you're a liability. We have less population, more resources. We are, you know, an asset. So in the context of whether India or Pakistan, if you have too much population and less land and resources, you're a liability, you know? So I think it's a good thing that Gilgit Baltistan doesn't have, you know, too many people living there, but an uh, enormous amount of land uh, uh, and, and resources. Um, in 1949, Pakistan divided POJK into Gilgit Baltistan and what they call Azad Kashmir. Uh, so the, what you know, India did now, the reorganization of state uh, happened in, in, in Pakistani occupation 1949. Pakistan took Gilgit Baltistan in direct control without any uh, political or constitutional setup the way we live right now. But for AJK, the POK, they gave its own constitution, its own president, its own prime minister, its own flag, everything. But they didn't give them the, the sovereignty, right? 
So the sovereignty of POJK or AJK stays with Pakistan. Pakistan make all the decisions on, on the POJK, but you know, they gave them a setup that looks like a country. This is a map which is very interesting. This is a map of 1948-49. The Yan and Gilgit is that of international border. So even United Nations maps from that time recognize that Pakistan and India do not have the same relationship with POJK or, or JNK as a whole. Pakistan is an occupier and it was asked to withdraw, right? We all know it gave, uh, Pakistan was given 90 days. Pakistan never uh, respected that. But India, because of letter of accession, was accepted as, as a country that is supposed to uh, protect the life, assets, and honor of people of Jammu and Kashmir. So even if there was a plebiscite to happen, it was going to be uh, uh, under the supervision of Indian government. We know that. And Pakistan was going to, to vacate and stay out till the final decision of the plebiscite. So India has a very legal central role even in the referendum and plebiscite. It has to work with the United Nations and provide all the security and logistics as well as you know, the, the whole framework. Uh, so I think that is, that's an important point that we need to know. Uh, so here's a news cutting from Pakistani newspaper says, the, pa the Minister for Kashmir Affairs says that as per Pakistani constitution, Pakistani parliament is not allowed to even discuss POJK. Mm -hmm. So they know that, you know, they, their hands are tight, they can't do anything, but they still want to benefit from its location and geostrategic importance. So this is the huge mismatch, right, that we are stuck with. What's the difference between the Gilgit uh, part and you said Azad Kashmir? Yeah. So, where's the pen? Is this the red one? All right. Then. So in 1949, they reorganized POJ, POJK, right? This whole thing is POJK. And then they turned this into AJK or Azad Kashmir. Okay. Then the so-called Neelam Valley, Mirpur, that area, which is, which is parallel to the India's Jammu and India's Jammu and Kashmir, is what they call Ajat Kashmir. Yeah, there so is a misconception. Gilgit was never POK. They used to call it as Northern Territories sometimes. Yeah, it was it was a province of Kashmir. It was called Northern Province of yeah, Kashmir Northern province. before partition. So this is all Jammu. Yeah. Uh, valley is here, right? Yeah. So even though valley is not you know directly in touch physically with the Pakistani occupied part, they still call it POK or Pakistan occupied yeah. Kashmir, which is which is kind of like you know confusing. So do people want to be part of Pakistan, or they want to be independent, or they want to be part of India? I think right now they want to be. Uh, they want yeah, a huge majority want independence. I don't think you know there there's a um, any sentiments for Pakistan that way. There was a hope, as I said, till the 1980s and 90s that Pakistan has the same status with vis-a-vis -vis JNK like India. But now they know that you know it, it's almost impossible for Pakistan to incorporate it. Uh, so I think they do not have uh, you know those sentiments the way they used to have. Was it democratic composition you are talking about here? You know, in 1.5 million people, was it democratic composition? What is the what the composition religion or languages? Religion, language, like religion. Basically. So religion, uh, P O uh, K is I would say about eighty percent Sunni. Eighty percent Sunni. Yeah, eighty eighty five percent Sunni, about fifteen percent Shia, and Gilgit Baltistan, you know, they changed the demography. So now you you can say about seventy percent they affiliate with Shia, different Shia sects, and. And Sunnis used to be about you know 10 to 15 percent, but now I think it's jumped to 30 some percent. But the significance is that the people are settled very strategically, right? So they are going to economic hubs, they're going to the capital of Gilgit Baltistan, they're going to uh, to the to the land which is along the Karagram Highway, which connects China and Pakistan. This is you know where their focus is. They want to change demography. So Pakistan and China connection is secured. So that's where, you know, in 1988, a huge massacre happened, which went on for about 16 days. They burned about like, I think, 15 or 16 villages. 
and all those um, villages, you know, mostly they lie along the Karakam Highway, so they wanted to change the demography there. So there is no non-Muslim population at all? I, I don't know after 1971, but I, I do believe that not before 1971, there are a couple of villages in Baltistan which had Buddhist population. But didn't they change the demographics of POK also, um, with the minorities as they live in the area? So, uh, are you talking about like uh, in 1947 when Hindus... No, afterward. I mean, after, since the Pakistan has occupied that whole area, yeah. Which includes POK and Balochistan. Don't they, haven't they changed the demographics who, like Hindus and, you know, who are Sunni, uh, I mean, not Sunni, but uh, Shia Muslims. I believe that Hindus too, yeah. They have, they have really changed the demographics of that population. In, in AJK, mm -hmm. I do believe that, you know, Hindus are forced. Yeah, they are forced yeah, they into forced. conversion. Yeah. Even, even now that they force the girls, they take them away and marry them to Muslims. And then, you know, whether they want it or not, and, you know, that's still happening. What most conversions are happening in Sindh province? Sindh province. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that AJK has any uh, Hindu population left. Left, yeah, they're all... Uh, they're most of them, you know, they ended up in, uh, uh, in Delhi, mm -hmm. some, some in Jammu, I guess, yeah, mostly in Delhi. Uh, but I don't believe that they have any Hindu population left. I'll be very surprised if there are Hindus still living in AJK. So Kashmiri are different than Muslims are different? Sorry? Kashmiri means, what is that? So Kashmiri is a linguistic identity, mm -hmm. right? And within Kashmiri they have Muslims, Hindus, Sikh, and Buddhist. And Buddhist. They, they speak different, I mean they speak the same language, but they follow different religions. So that's Kashmiri. What's the percentage wise? So uh, that has also changed over time. So I, I will talk about Indian Kashmir. So Indian Indian part of the Kashmir, as you you know, um, we just mentioned about what happened in '47. So uh, what happened was slowly it started with about six percent or seven percent in in 1947. But slowly, because that that had dropped, it was 100% Hindus, right? Then they became Buddhists. Then they became converts. And the conversion happened when all the uh, Muslim um, kings and others occupied that area. But there were still about six, seven percent who were Hindus still in 1947. So after 1947, again it started with a slow uh, mi a migration that would, we will call it migration. And by the time 1980s, it was about uh, uh, five percent or so. But now it's less than 2,000 people here. Because then in 1990, so on our side, yeah, on our side, we don't have any Kashmiris. We don't have Kashmiri don't have, the speaking Kashmiris people. The Kashmiris that dialect uh, speaking Kashmiris we are talking about is not is only on Kash, uh, Indian side. Yeah. How many Shia are there in Kashmir? How many Shia population is there in Indian Kashmir? Indian Kashmir, maybe less than three or four percent. I don't, I don't know exactly how many, but it's no, not. All the Muslims are in Kashmir. Uh, it's mostly Kashmir. Sunni Muslims. No, Sunni Muslims. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Let's get on with the talk and then we'll have an interaction later because we don't want the speaker. I'm okay, you know. <laughs> we have a time off. You can use me the way you want. Yeah, this, this will answer. There is so much of curiosity, a lot of you know, know, questions you know, raising up. We'll conclude the talk in another 20 minutes and then we'll open up. So, second important reason why local people have turned against Pakistan is. Pakistan giving China a free hand, yes. right? So the fact that we do not have a constitutional setup to protect our land and identity, the way Indian Kashmir has, or Jammu has. So now the Chinese are occupying our resources. Mm -hmm. They're occupying our pastures. They are destroying our irrigation networks. Uh, the, the speaker of the local assembly, he said that uh, and it's on record, literally every important mountain and pasture have been leased out now. Mm. Locals do not have access there. And when the Chinese uh, take up uh, local resources and lease them, then what the Pakistani military do is that they stop locals from accessing those pastures. So if the locals are dependent on livestock, for instance, then, you know, the major chunk of their livelihood is dependent on livestock, 
obviously what would happen is that they would be forced to change their livelihoods and uh, professions. And if they're not trained in any other profession, they would, they would lose a major chunk of their wealth, right? So this is what's happening with our rural areas right now. They're losing their wealth. They're forced to migrate, you know, to urban areas and then eventually to Pakistan. So it's leading to huge demographic change. Um, the Chinese, are they building dams there? And uh, Chinese are also like, you know, uh, digging up gold and copper and heavy metals and other gems and uh, uh, they're just siphoning and, you know, taking it back to China, not paying local people any, uh, you know, d d revenues that are due. They are not involving local people, so the jobs are going to the Chinese, they're bringing their own Han workers, right? They're even bringing their own technology, their own, own machines and equipment, and everything is coming from China. So they're not really involving local people. But they're very smart. So what they do is at the management level, they, they hire one or two people who are related to influential political families and call them their managers to show that you know, these are local companies. And they give them uh, Pakistani names. Mm -hmm. But that real ownership on, on their paper stays with the Chinese uh, nationals in Chinese Han. So they, they're very you know, uh, smart in the, that way to camouflage uh, to the outside world. Uh, so this is what's happening in, in Gilgit Baltistan right now, that most of our land has been leased out. All our resources uh, are, you know, at the mercy of outsiders. It's been almost uh, 12 years since Pakistan put a ban on local people. So local people cannot do mining anymore, because otherwise they would be compete the, uh, competing with outsiders. So that's, you know, how brutal the Pakistani system is, where the local people are banned to use their own resources, outsiders are exploiting it, mm -hmm. and they're not sharing the revenue or the jobs or the services or any benefits with the local people. So there's, you know, huge chunks of land that have been leased out, important land along the Karakam Highway, up close to the glaciers. And uh, I will show you a slide where the minister says anyone who opposes uh, Chinese projects will be declared a terrorist. So hundreds and hundreds of people are uh, have been declared terrorists. There's a there's a article within the anti-terrorism law which is called Schedule Four. And under Schedule Four, what they do is they restrict you, your movement, physical movement, to your district, and you have to report to the police if you want to leave your district. They take away your jobs. They take away your bank accounts. They take away your ID cards and passports. And they're doing this to the youth who are opposing Chinese projects and projects of other um, international companies there, including Pakistani. So that is something that has really turned the local people against against Pakistan. So that one is going to independent side or want Pakistan? Yeah. So these people they don't they don't want any part of Pakistan. They, they have seen Pakistan enough for the 70 years, and they don't think. And now slowly they're saying, you know. Given what India has done for the Kashmiris, now you, you, you will hear a lot of people saying, uh, if we can be independent, we want to be with India, but we don't want to be with Pakistan. So there's this you know, new uh, wave of uh, you know, uprising. Um, and that's why you know, pa Pakistan is very scared and they're putting everyone in jail. So I'm going to show you slides later, which I don't know how many people are, uh, sitting here can see, but I, I will show some faces of people who have been given 90 years in jail who have been given 60 years in jail, 35 years in jail, just for opposing this exploitation. So these people are, you know, they're very strictly anti-Pakistan. They say, if there's no option for independence, we'll go with India. So, you know, this thing is, you know, coming up now. The Karakram Highway, for instance, it is uh, in the ownership of Pakistani military. So all the people who build Karakram Highway have to be Pakistani by law. They, they don't induct local people. So, you know, they're really angry about that too. Um, the custom check post on the Chinese border, for instance, all the revenue goes to Islamabad. By Pakistani law, Gilgit Baltistan cannot keep any revenue. So, you know, their system, because it's non-constitutional, right, it's so um, arbitrary and it's, it's so, uh, you know, um, like um, uh, cruel and brutal and, you know, like, uh, something that locals have realized, you know, what, what they thought that Pakistan might emerge as a benign, you know, country, but I, they, they believe that, you know, the dishonesty and the cruelty 
is is enshrined in their own constitution, their own system that they have been ruling, you know, the country with for the last 70 years. So, uh, uh, so I think this is what the locals have realized. Uh, so there are Pakistani institutions, which are federal institutions that they have membership of all the federating units like Balochistan, KPK, Sindh and Punjab. These are the four federating units, right? This is what Pakistan is. And they control all the resources and they have a veto. So for instance, if one of the federating units does not agree, they cannot really legislate on them. Um, so these are called like you know, national economic commissions, council of common interest, uh, national hydroelectric boards, Industry River System Authority, you know, these are international national organizations. Gilgit Baltistan or POK does not have membership there. So what, what it means that when they exploit our rivers, they don't give us any royalty. So for instance, Pakistan owes us more than I think 40 billion rupees a year. Uh, so if you add, you know, year, let's say last 40 years to 40 billion, I mean, it'd be like maybe trillions in rupees. And Pakistan doesn't pay even a single penny to us. And they, they continue to exploit our water resources and all the dams are built on it. Uh, whereas if, uh, if the same dam is to be built in one of their own provinces, then they will get a huge chunk of royalty as well as the yearly compensation, the usage compensation, right? Royalty plus usage compensation. We don't get any of that. So that is also you know, a big uh, source of um, uh, anger and, and hatred and resent, resentment among the local people. Um, so these are some of the pictures. I don't know if, if you can see. The, so these are the places where the Chinese uh, stay now. You know, they have built like uh, permanent residences there. What is the one? These are the trucks that they bring all the way from China. They don't trust Pakistani trucks, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They have their own drivers. They don't take local. I mean, no jobs for locals. Everything literally, you know. They, these are the mining companies that the Chinese have established there. These uh, are the Chinese building a dam there. You know. So if you look at this green part, this is the Indus River catchment area, and all the agriculture land will be underwater once this dam is built. It's called the Amr Dam. It's about 100 kilometers long and uh, uh, it will, you know, inundate uh, literally entire district of the Amir. Um, yeah. And then the next one is uh, Katsura Dam. It will inundate the entire Shigar and Skardo district, these two districts, where almost 50% of Baltistan's population live. So all the agriculture land and you know residential and urban areas will go underwater, and these are being uh, built and planned uh, by Pakistan. Um, so these are the, the the pictures of local people protesting against um, lack of constitutional rights and and the Chinese projects and and um, Pakistani military grabbing land. Um, so this is a huge prote protest in Skardo, I guess, yeah, against uh, Chinese projects. These are the people who are protesting against Bonji Dam, against, uh, again, a Chinese project. Uh, Chinese Dam, the Amir, what is this? Uh, uh, for land compensation, KK, Krakram Highway. So these are the homes that have been destroyed by, you know, Pakistan to build dams. And, um, so from 1947 onward, we haven't received any land compensation for any infrastructure that Pakistan has built. Uh, these are again homes destroyed, lands taken. Um, so this is the person who got 91 years in jail for trying to protect local lands. And he's, in, he's only 30 some years old. He has been jailed for only nine years now. He still have you know another uh, about eighty some eight years to go. But look at his you know it looks like he's probably sixty. Uh, he got about I think sixty some years because he um, he actually uh, he he's probably the most influential anti Chinese or anti you know like uh, um, what's the name? What's his name? Uh, his name is Babajan. 
He's really famous. Um, you know, there's a lot of articles written about him. Is he too or what? Well, he speaks Shina, but he's from Hunza district. So Hunza is a mix of uh, Shina and Brzezinski, but I think he's Shina speaking. Uh, Pakistani military, you know, again, there's another uh, reason why local people are very angry at Pakistan is because the military is taking land from them, um, kicking people out of their homes in the name of Kashmir issue, in the name of like, you know, providing security to the Chinese engineers and construction workers. Um, thousands and thousands of acres of land has been taken from the local people. They have turned Skardo and Gilgit town into like, you know, like ghettos where they're like check posts every like few hundred yards. And you know, local people have so much difficulty reaching from point A to point B. Um, and then extra judicial killings and murders, you know, they're, a lot of, you have heard about Baloch missing person, right? We also have a lot of uh, missing person in Gilgit Baltistan uh, that, you know, military and ISI is involved, you know, kidnapping them. This is an article by a local journalist who says that a lot of th these lands are being transferred to PLA, People's Liberation Army of China, and they come as engineers, they come as technicians, they come as like, you know, uh, experts on different like mining projects and others, but they are part of PLA. Uh, this is army telling the local people the land belongs to army, so anyone, you know, will be prosecuted. Uh, these are the local people in Ganshe district, which is on uh, Nubra, bo it borders Nubra. Um, and, you know, they're rising uh, against Pakistani uh, establishment for grabbing land. These are people in Gilgit city, again, against army. And this actually went viral because, you know, all the women came out and they start chanting um, slogans. These are the people against, thousands of people here against, you know, army grabbing their land in Nomal, which is part of Gilgit district. Um, another reason why local people um, see Pakistan as, as, uh, as an enemy is Shia killing, right? So local people, you know, don't support jihad. Local people do not accommodate the, the terrorist. Um, so there's all this clash between, you know, the jihadis and the local people, you know. I was there when, when the clashes were happening and, you know, they were trying to attack local women and trying to grab land and um, uh, they were trying to, uh, you know, occupy homes, not paying rents, for instance. Uh, so they, not only that they are killing Shias, but they're also attacking the local minority cultures. For instance, Ismailis, you know, you probably heard about Ismailis. There are many Ismailis in Mumbai and, you know, yes. other parts of Maharashtra and Gujarat, right? So now these jihadis, they're attacking Ismailis when they have their own cultural activities. And Ismailis, you know, happen to be extremely liberal. Liberal to the point that, you know, majority of the Muslims don't even consider them Muslim anymore, right? So they, they attack them. And then the uh, Shias, you know, for instance, they have their Muharram procession about Karbala and, and they get attacked. And uh, so Shia killing in the last about 30 to 40 years, 23,000 Shias have been killed. And it's a huge, you know, anathema for the Pakistani state and the local people. It's an embarrassment that they cannot really control because they are dependent on these people for Kashmir jihad or Afghan jihad, right? So they can't really control them. And, and Shia killing and polarization of society is also a source of recruitment, right? Unless you, you polarize uh, a, a mind of a child and, you know, make him extremist, you cannot really convince him to go and blow himself up. So there are different reasons why, uh, you know, these people do that. It's not just money, it's also like, you know, conviction. Uh, so one of the thing is that, you know, uh, they say, uh, and they say it openly, I mean, you can have videos on YouTube, they're saying the Shias are worse than Hindus, because they are killing Islam or they are, um, you know, polluting Islam, uh, polluting within Islam, right? They're, they are adding to pollution within that religion, whereas the Hindus are outsiders. So, you know, your first enemy is a Shia. That's how they, they say. So then these children, you know, they, they get radicalized like that. that that Shias must, you know, have done a lot of damage to Islam, right? So this is, this is one of the, the reasons why they're so anti-Shia or anti-Smiley. Um, and, you know, they're killing Shias everywhere in, in Gilgit Baltistan. There's some pictures that I brought. Uh, there are a lot of conversion going on from, from uh, Sufi, Nurbakshi, to, to Wahhabi. So, you know, that's, uh, that's another reason why local people do not really 
trust the Pakistani system. Um, let's see. We have Taliban, you know, in some districts where the, the Sunnis make majority. Uh, but they have established, and in the past they had established, you know, their training camps in different parts. And they work with the Kashmiri militants. So that's another thing, that the Taliban and the Kashmiri terrorists, they work together. They have the same training camps in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. And from there, they kind of like, you know, get dispersed in different directions with different aims and objectives. So their collaboration is, um, you know, and, and, and the base that they, uh, that they work uh, on, the foundation and the logistical support, all are provided by the anti-Shia groups like uh, Sapai Sahaba and Lashkar Jangbi and, you know, you know Jundallah and these, you know, they provide them uh, with the resources and stuff. They attack local schools, they're against, you know, women education and... So they do pretty much the same thing they do in Afghanistan and Sabat Valley and they're attacking local people. So it's kind of like, you know, they are um, changing our culture, right? They are, I mean, in Pakistani schools, for instance, we're not allowed to um, learn our own languages. It's all about Islam, you know, it's all about like the history of the Mughals, how they invaded, how they, you know, destroyed Hindu temples, and then the British and, you know, how Muslims were persecuted, so they had to have their own country. It's all about Islam. So, um, nationalism based on your language, your ethnicity, everything is discouraged, right? So, and on top of that, this extremism that we see, that I've talked about, this is really changing our culture there. And this is making local people extremely insecure. And they're fighting back, but, you know, the whole system, the whole state is with the, with the people who have encroached upon us. So it's, it's kind of like losing battle, you know, if you look at it that way. So these are, you know, some of the buses with the Shias that were torched. I mean, you can find these pictures on internet. They're everywhere. Uh, so we have to travel about 600 kilometer from Gilgit Baltistan to reach Islamabad. And on the way, these people have their training camps. They're waiting. And they know exact location and the bus numbers and, you know, how many Shias are there because the ISI is really working with them. You know, if, you, if the Shias go to Iran, for instance, the, the moment the bus enters, you know, come back into Pakistan, they start tracking them. And they know exactly how many are from Gilgit Baltistan, how many are Hazara, you know, they have a very sophisticated system. And obviously it is there because the Pakistani intelligence system is working with them. So this is a very sad picture. So, you know, she has flagellate, right? How many of you know flagellation, right? So when they flagellate, they have blade marks on their back. So this person is checking his bag before killing him. So if, if, so let's say if, if, they ask, uh, what's your name? So she has, have, you know, certain very, like, particular names that you can tell uh, if you're Shia or Sunni. So even if he, uh, you know, let's say he decides to lie and he, he gives a very hardcore Sunni name, right? Mm -hmm. Then they will check his back to make sure that, you know, whether he has uh, flagellation marks or not. So he was killed after, and there's a, there's a whole video about it. These are the people who were stoned to death. These are the Shias. So... But they, sometimes they don't burn buses, they just stop the buses and stone them till the people inside, you know, eventually die, so. Um, so these are the protests, you know, they were happening against Shia killing, and people are openly saying that army is responsible for Shia killing, you know, they don't hide it anymore. Um, so, I don't know how many of you know, but in the 1960s and 70s, it was fed to us that India is behind Shia killing. <laughs> and we, our uh, parents probably believed it. So every time there was a Shia killing, they used to raise slogans of India Murdabad, right? So after, I think, 1990s or end of 1990s, during the Musharraf time, things started opening up. So now everyone strongly believes that it's all Pakistan army doing and it's not, you know, America, India, Israel, you know, the, the names that they use to, to distract local people from the real culprits. These are the women against Shia killing and Shia missing person. Hundreds of missing person, they... They're coming back from Iran after their um, pilgrims, and then they get picked up, taken to Karachi, Islamabad, different places, and, you know, uh, tortured. These are all, like, uh, and these are local people, local uh, influential people actually telling exact location of where the camps are, and still government not doing anything. So they tell you exactly what valley, which forest block, you know, they, they tell exact location of the camps, 
but they still exist there. So these are the news clippings showing the local people know where the training camps are, or the Kashmiri jihadis and the lashkar e taiba for instance, you know, or, or um, Taliban are. These are school burned by, by Taliban. So this is my third last, um, yeah, third last um, slide. And in Urdu, uh, this says, so, so there's a Kashmiri uh, writer from BOK, his name is Sayyid Asad, and he wrote a book and it's called uh, Historical and Constitutional Status of Gilgit Baltistan. And on page 17, he writes that he went to talk to uh, Mirza Hassan Khan, the main guy who separated Gilgit Baltistan from the Dogras and enabled Pakistan to capture it. And he said, uh, And he said, Mirza Sahib, you have a lot of good life. Is there any pain in your life? So he said, I have a lot of pain in my life that I have taken a lot of pain in my Dogra army. I have taken a commission and I have taken a half of an oath that I have taken a lot of pain in my country, Hari Singh, I'll say loyal to him. But in 1947, I rebelled against it. And then I rebelled against it. And then Sayyid Asad said, I have a Pakistani Moshere Kitra of Ishara Karkeka, like Pakistani society. I have a lot of people who are in the world. I have a lot of غیر جمہوری undemocratic غیر اخلاقی immoral اور بدترین معاشرے سے the worst of the society سے پڑے گا تو میں کبھی بغاوت نہ کرتا so this is the main guy the top guy who separated Gilgit and these are his words before death he's calling Pakistan the worst of the societies undemocratic inhumane immoral so you can you can imagine like you know people have realized what Pakistan is is you know literally so, so basically what you're saying is when the attack happened in 40, November 47, 47 mm -hmm. there was this whole group which supported the Pakistan army coming in to separate this territory into Pakistan. Uh, was the army not there? The army was not there. No, these were all the Maharaja's soldiers. Ah, Maharaja's soldiers. So in Punch and in Gilgit there was a rebellion. क्योंकि महाराजा ने एक्सेशन किया इंडिया के साथ तो ये वो लोग हैं फिर उसके बाद इन्होंने अपना रिपब्लिक स्टैब्लिश किया गिलगित में उसको फिर पाकिस्तान ने ले लिया राइट सो दे टर्न्ड अगेंस्ट द महाराजा या दे टर्न्ड अगेंस्ट या सो दे रिबेल्ड अगेंस्ट महाराजा इतने सब सालों में यूएस की पोजीशन ह्य� उस सिचुएशन में फंसा हुआ था, राइट? तो इसलिए पाकिस्तान और चाइना बोथ वर रियली इम्पोर्टेंट अगेंस्ट रूसिया, अगेंस्ट सोवियत यूनियन। एंड इफ यू लुक एट यू नो व्हाट हिस्ट्री शोज अस दैट शिंजियांग और गिलगित बिकेम द मेन ट्रेनिंग कैंप्स फॉर फाइटर्स हु वर ट्रेन देर एंड देन सेंट so China was openly uh, cooperating because China had a long vision that Russia is the, the biggest you know, competitor when it comes to the left bloc. So if there's no Soviet Union, then China is going to lead the left bloc, right? So, and, and again, there's a huge difference between Stalinist and Maoist ideology, right? Marxist and Maoist ideology. So it was very convenient for China to work that way. So United States had a very you know, open position that they recognized line of control and they recognize Pakistan's control over it. And that has changed now. So if you listen to, for instance, the State Department, you know, different uh, um, statements coming from press releases, it says that CPAC is passing through Gilgit, which has a challenge sovereignty by India, and it's a disputed area, so Pakistan and China should not do that. So that, that's a change in position of the United States that the United States, you know, openly challenging uh, what China is doing there now. So I think there's, there's a big shift there. But if you, if you ask me, they don't consider, uh, as the government policy, United States, a State Department or the White House would not consider it as part of India. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
not as of now. Is it a huge win for Brazil? Yes. Yes. So. No, we. I have two more slides. So. so conclusion. I mean, I'm just going to read it. So I believe that we are Indians. We are Indian citizens. We should be reunited with India because India has um, everything to offer, right? When it comes to culture, when it comes to uh, economy, when it comes to um, uh, a vibrant society, when it comes to the civilization, you know, it, it is uh, the, the home for all of us. So uh, this division that happened in 1947, it was seen you know, artificial and it has hurt everyone. So I believe that we need to be re reunited and I believe that the world must acknowledge to start that Pakistan is an occupier and it has to withdraw from GB and you know India uh, I believe that has a responsibility um, so when when the United when, when Pakistan is occupying Gilgit and if you read the UN resolutions it says India has the responsibility to protect life honor and assets so that means India has the responsibility to push Pakistan out Otherwise, how are you, you know, how will you protect life, honor, and asset if Pakistan is still there and India is not able to protect local citizens? So India has a constitutional responsibility to protect Gilgit Baltistan from Pakistan. Uh, I believe that, you know, India should help build a UN tribunal to investigate all the, the Shia genocide and, you know, the unmarked graves. The, the, the involuntary female disappearances, you know, they, they captured our females during uh, genocide and the pre presence of terrorist camps there. So I think India has a responsibility. It should work, you know, uh, with the UN in that regard. Uh, we believe that uh, this proxy representation that the Kashmiris enjoyed for such a long time, you know, it, it, it has come to an end now, which is a good thing. But, you know, we have always spoken against that, that the Kashmiris do not represent us. Uh, you know, Huriyat Conference or Umar Abdullah, Mufti, all, all the, they don't represent us. So now I think the time has come. Now UT Ladakh has been established. You know, we should have a direct representation in India. So even though physically we're not, you know, with India right now, but we should have representation in India's constitutional and uh, legislative bodies. So I don't know how, you know, I was talking to Banuji that Article 370 representation hona Lok Sabha mein, Raja Sabha mein. But we like the word that you have termed, which is P-O-L. Yeah, Pakistan Akbar Ladakh. We're not Pakistan occupied Jammu Kashmir anymore. So that We're is done with that. That's the beginning. Yeah. And most of us will definitely lobby so that you will have some representation in India. Thank you so much. Yeah. Ye, Jitne America mein Indians hain, hum sabko milkar ye lobby karni chahiye.